Welcome everybody. My name is Tracy Rector and I'm coming to you from the traditional homelands of the Puyallup people just south of Seattle, Washington. Um, thank you for joining us in this 47th year of the Seattle International Film Festival and this live Q&A with Tracy Deer of Beans, the director. Um, we're so excited to have you here, Tracy. Welcome. Thank you. And if I yeah, for sure. Um, and if I may um, just take a moment to say how moved I am by your story. And I just am so grateful that you took this time on a Sunday to um, share some of your process and your thoughts and who you are with us. Um, can I ask if you would please introduce yourself to the audience? Absolutely. So my name is Tracy Deer. I am a Mohawk writer, director, showrunner. I am from Ganawage Mohawk territory, which is located just outside of Montreal, Quebec. And I have been in this business now for 20 years. I started as a documentary filmmaker, moved on to television and Beans is my first narrative feature. Well, congratulations. It's an incredible first feature. Thank you. Um, yeah, for sure. And for the audience, just a little bit about me. I've um, My name's Tracy Rector and I've been working with SIP for 15 years now, um, coordinating indigenous educational programs for youth and adults, as well as programming films and um, curating experiences with uh, the tribal nations in our region, as well as visiting global indigenous content creators. Um, we are this year, we've launched a new name, Sydney Indigenous, to inco incorporate the screenings, the um, events, and our educational classrooms. And so this is really um, an exciting moment for us to bring all of this under one umbrella. So just wanted to share that with the audience. Also, feel free to use the chat fun to engage um, and or send questions. And we also have someone who's helping us on the back end moderating this. All right, um, so with that, Tracy, if I may ask if you can describe um, the story of Beans to our audience who may yet, uh, who haven't had a chance to watch it and um, we'll start there. Absolutely, so Beans is a coming of age story of a of a 12 year old Mohawk girl that takes place during the 1990 Oka crisis, which was an indigenous uprising that happened up here in Canada. For those of you that may have never heard of it, um, it was a 78 day armed standoff between two Mohawk communities and the province of Quebec, as well as the government of Canada. Um, the Canadian government sent in the army and surrounded us with tanks and uh, cut off our food cut off our communication, um, cut off medical supplies. Uh, and I happened to be 12 years old uh, when all of this happened. So the film is very much inspired by my own coming of age story, uh, but it is fictionalized. Um, many of the, there are many historical moments that we recreated in the film. And those are very much drawn from actual things that happened that summer. You read my mind. I was going to ask because there's so many details and moments that feel incredibly personal. And I was curious at what point, you know, your life really blended with the story that we were seeing. Um, and for me, one of the first moments was when the, um, the mom, Lily, and the two girls are in the car and singing, you know, we got the power. It's like that just felt so real <laughs> and tangible. <laughs> I'm thrilled to hear it. I mean, that is definitely what we, we set out to do is to just really try to, you know, create real characters, real moments. And uh, that is actually one of my most favorite shots in the film. I feel like all three of them really gelled as a family, uh, really let their personalities out. Um, I, there, I mean, there's so many moments in the film actually that I, I just adore, but uh, having the three of them together and putting forward that tight, familiar relationship and, and, and joy. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of very hard moments in the film, but I, I wanted to make sure we also saw a lot of 
joy and love as well. And I think that that, that is one of those moments. Yeah, I think about singing in the car with people, that generally means there's a lot of trust. Yes. And <laughs> I was just like, it's so joyful, but it also for me spoke to um, perhaps your intention, I'm not sure, but what came across strongly is that this is a really um, beautiful family being portrayed with trust and consideration and strength and complexity but idyllic in some ways too. All right, well, I'm thrilled to hear. I'm thrilled to hear that that's, that that's what you got from it. I do think that much of my childhood was very idyllic. And that summer is, it, it was a shattering of, of my innocence really. Um, but there, there was and is still just so much love within my, my immediate family, my extended family, and then with the, within the community itself. So it was really important to me to put, to put that portrayal of, of family um, out there. Yeah, I can't think of another time where there's this um, way that we were introduced to the sense of safety at the same time someone was going through a coming of age crisis. Um, you know, some of the, you know, some of those really intense moments that Beans was faced with were just so heartbreaking and just that shattering of innocence. But there's a way where I felt like, well, she's going to be held by this amazing family too. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just, it made me think about the complexities that you brought forward um, at the same time, this incredible beauty, but also just these life shattering moments or what could be life shattering moments. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as I said, it was, it's been inspired by my own coming of age, but my, my coming of age journey, I would say went from 12 years old to 22, you know, I mean, it's just a, such a hard period. So I called from that those 10 years, what were these big moments that shaped me and pushed me and that challenged me um, and sort of packaged them all into um, that, that one summer. And I mean, really that summer is, was the shattering of the innocence and the beginning of that hard road into adulthood and figuring out what it means to be an indigenous person, what it means to be an indigenous person within my community, within the bigger world. And you know, you mentioned the sense of safety within this family. I mean, that is the thing that I think I, I really lost outside of my family. You know, I, that summer I learned that the world was dangerous and it was dangerous because of who I am. Um, and as a 12 year old, I, I did not know how to process that. I, I, and and even within the, the love and the safety of my family, I don't think my parents were even equipped to help help us help us navigate that. You know, so so we ended up doing a lot of it on our own, and that that's that's hard. That's really hard. And I, I, mm -hmm. I first and foremost, um, I just don't think I don't want. Um, I don't want our kids to view the outside world as dangerous and unsafe. So a, a big, a big part of the goal of this film is for people to understand what it is to be indigenous. And, and I'm hoping it's a bit of a call of action, not a bit of, I want it to be a large call of action for, for audiences to go out back into the world and say, how do I, how do I change things? How do I make it better so that our kids do have the same chances for success and their dreams coming true and to thrive. Um, I hope everyone leaves the film thinking, oh my, like loving beans and then wanting to do whatever they can to help girls and boys like beans. Absolutely, thank you for that. That um, to me speaks to your background in working with young people mm. and um, which is so powerful in the way that perhaps maybe the lead actress was comfortable and just really stepping into her strength um, 
And how did you find her? <laughs> she was incredible. Isn't she, isn't she just amazing? Um, I'm so proud of her. Uh, so we did a, an open casting call across Canada to find the four young roles. Um, we, we did the traditional route to start where, you know, you put out a call to casting through the casting director. There's a call out to agents and we got maybe three, three auditions in. And I, I knew, I knew that, you know, our kids and our young aspiring actors, they're not represented. So it was a, it was an open call across the country and we had kids from across the country uh, videotape themselves in their kitchens, in their bedrooms, in the backyard, uh, and send in their auditions. It was amazing um, and so heartwarming to, to see all of the interest. We narrowed it down for each role to five, um, the short list of five, and we flew them all into Toronto for a three-day acting workshop. Um, we had an acting coach um, on this film, so she led the workshop and it really was a two-day learn more about acting workshop so it wasn't very specific to the film they were doing all different types of acting exercises and connecting with one another um, I was there the whole time just watching them watching how they how they handled the exercises what kind of vulnerability they were willing to show how much did they grow over two days uh, and then at the end, we did another round of auditions with all of them there. And because I had each role represented, I was able to pair them up into combinations that I was interested to see what kind of chemistry they would have. Uh, because we did have a brother and a sister that needed to really be believable as that brother and sister. And then we had a little sister and a big sister that also had to be believable. So after that, we found three roles, one of them being Beans, Giao and Dio, um, and then Hank and April were also found there. And um, the younger role, it, it, it's tougher because uh, I, needed a, I needed somebody young uh, who could handle everything that this film was going to entail. And a lot of what that is, is, is a lot of sitting around and waiting. It's long days. Um, and I was, I, it, it's, it's nerve wracking, um, trying to, trying to find that, that, that young girl who, who is, who's so into it that she's happy to sit around and wait all day. Um, so that search went on for a little bit longer and I ended up finding Viola Bove from my community at the very last oh, moment Ruby. she came to me. <laughs> Ruby, Ruby's from Ganawage. Yeah. So that makes me so happy. Oh, she just melted my heart. Just yeah. powerful and authentic and honest and full, just adoring her big sister energy. And oh. Yeah. She's brilliant. Just brilliant. And you know what I what I did notice, especially from her, one, she's been wanting to be an actress ever since she was a little, like little, little. But the the, the thing too about this new generation is they are growing up in front of cameras constantly. They're creating content constantly and posting. And so uh, Viola was just so comfortable in front of the camera that it never phased her. And, you know, our gear can be giant sometimes. And there's a few shots where it's literally like a foot in front of her face, this giant camera staring her down. And, you know, she's sitting there and she's chatting and never... When it was time to say action, you know, there was never a moment where she was, oh, okay, now I have to, you know, she just was like, okay, now, okay. And then she went, um, it was, it's incredible. She's naturally talented and gifted, this young, they all are, they all are. Yeah, I, I was blown away by both of their performances. Everyone's really, um, but especially young people, youth, it just feels like that's another um, degree of complication and care that's needed as a director to really bring forward those performances in a story like this too. Um, but wow, I just, I can't wait to see more from both of them. Um, also, Lily, the mom, I just was so whew, blown away from, so that moment when they were walking out of school 
And Beans had that thought that maybe she had said something wrong. And her mother absorbed that and just like, no, 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 I should have prepped you. Um, and just thinking about those loving moments that were just so very specific to making sure that a human's self-confidence wasn't, you know, damaged or harmed. Mm. And how just as a pr very pregnant woman, <laughs> was just like carrying things and, you know, shuffling children and standing on the front line. Um, but that when she started crying, I think it was at the Mercier Bridge. Yeah. Um, wow, those tears and that her the tension in her body that she held and that vulnerability. Yeah. Um, again, I think it was just such a successful moment as a director bringing out all these layers of kind of mutual complication and nuance. Thank you. That, that scene in particular is pulled directly from my memory. So I was that young girl in the front seat on the floor and um, I, wanted, I wanted that scene to play out exactly the way I remembered it. And Rainbow Dickerson who played Lily just did such a phenomenal job. I mean, it was the first time in my life that I had seen my mom in that vulnerable position in that vulnerable state you know my mom is formidable you know she's she's everything um and so for these people to have attacked sure they attacked all of us but for them to have done that to my mother it just tore me apart and it just made me so angry and then I and then I lived with that anger um and not not knowing what to do with it for for a long time Yeah, I um, imagine perhaps that scene with the young girl in the pool, around the pool table, yes. um, that reflected that kind of anger and needing an outlet. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we see, we see it. We see that all the time. You know, I've, 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 I see the, the outbursts and the violence, um, that, that occurs within our communities and within our families. And mm -hmm. I, I just know there's so much pain and, and unresolved anger that feeds those outbursts. So that I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that the connection, um, that you saw the, that you see the connection there that I was going for in the film. And what you're describing too um, feels as though that was coming forward in April's story that we learn about her abuse and the pain, but we also learn about why April is the way she is and why her defenses exactly. are not. Yeah, exactly. Um, growing up, I I was beans, so I was I was shy. I was creative. I was like the wimpiest mohawk ever. <laughs> um, oh. and, and I would look, I would, I looked up to these tough girls and just wanted to be tough like them. And it's, it's, as you grow older and as you age, as I aged, I should say, um, and I, and I had to find my toughness. Mm -hmm. There's that understanding that all of those, all of those tough people that, that did occasionally bully me that did. Um, yeah, it wasn't always, it wasn't always nice. Um, there's, there's an, I, you just gain an understanding that they had to, you know, why did they have to be so tough? And there's, there's a reason why we, we, we get that hard and that tough and, and it's a tragedy, you know, what, what our kids are dealing with and then what we grow up with, what we grow up carrying. And um, yeah, I wanted to bring a lot of that compassion and understanding and context to April's character. Mm -hmm. She was also an incredible yes. actress. So where is she from? Uh, she is in, is she in Winnipeg? She's in, I believe she's in Winnipeg, yes. Okay. Paulina, Paulina Alexis, yes. Mm. Um, 
Well, thank you for that insight. Another thought um, that I was, you know, just really kind to translate into another experience was um, the shopping scene mm -hmm. and going into town for groceries. And in Standing Rock, I remember people talking about when that initially occurred, that there wasn't something similar to that since the Oka crisis. And I remember in some of those small towns in North Dakota, how stores would refuse to sell to natives, hardware stores would refuse to sell supplies. And in that scene in your film, um, I remembered, oh yeah, that's a tactic that's used out of racism, out of trying to assert power. Um, right. Yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that moment in that scene, that'd be great. Sure, so that is based on um, true events that, that did occur. Um, that scene, in, that scene in particular, um, was is a fictionalized version. I the, my experience with that happened after the Yoka crisis. So once the crisis was over, everything did not go back to you know lovely coexisting. So I remember going to our neighboring community and and going inside with my mother and uh, getting the looks and and getting the glares and my mother just being like, okay like leaving the basket and saying, we're leaving, let's go. And then the next time we went, she, she kept us in the car um, with the car, with the door locked and, um, and she went in by herself. So, but, but during the crisis, this, this search for food, um, either, either leaving the reserve, uh, which you see in the archival moment, you see that they, they leave on foot to go get groceries and then that mob happens, but the fictionalized version is going by boat. And that's another thing that did happen is because we were cut off at the roads, uh, we took a boat across the St. Lawrence to go grocery shopping. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted people to see how, how everyday people were engaged in what was going on. You know, it wasn't just the army and soldiers and police. Um, this was, this was being, played out and fought um, by everyday people as well. Yeah, that's what came across and in, in some ways was, um, I would say the most painful, for example, that exchange with the store manager, like, you know me, like, <laughs> what's going on here? Where's Whereas the shift or maybe that veil was ripped, ripped back and people saw for the first time how those closest to them felt. Right, well, you know, there's also, there's, there's, this, there's this strange middle ground with people who they make, an, they make the exception for you. You know, they, you know, I've certainly heard like you're one of the good ones or you're not like the rest kind of thing that, that it, and so I've, I've lived it myself and um, yeah, when, when push comes to shove, like, are you, are you really my friend? Are you really an ally? Do you really care? Uh, like, and I, and I think it's in those, it's in those moments of um, extreme stress where, you know, who you really are is, is going to come out. And unfortunately that store manager didn't have, you know, the courage and the strength to, to stand, to stand up. Like he, he, he gave in to them, to the, to the crowd, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The kind of myth of the model minority, it's, um, but what are those relationships in reality when people are projecting or perceiving a person, you know, in only a one dimensional way. And that seemed to be um, loud and clear in that moment. Um, but thank you for also saying that he didn't stand up to the crowd um, yeah. and was reflecting that as well. One of the questions actually from the audience is, was it hard to find extras to play those angry mobs in your story? So no, it wasn't. 
Um, and here's, here's the thing. Um, I knew going into making this film, um, I didn't want, I wanted to share this story, but not at any cost. So it was, we made very deliberate decisions along the way to do it in the safest way possible. Um, these young children did not live through the Oka crisis and I certainly did not want to pass on any of my trauma onto them. So very deliberate shooting plans, uh, intimacy coordinators, stand-ins, um, lots of actions were taken to, to make every day fun, even when we were recreating these very difficult moments. And one of the things that we did, that I, that I did, was um, often when you're booking extras, they're not told what they're coming in to do. They're, they're called, they're given a date, a time, what they need to bring to wear, and they, they either confirm or say, oh, sorry, I can't. Um, I did not want that to happen for this film. I didn't want people to show up and then find out they had to play like an angry racist all day. Um, that's not something anyone should be um, forced to do or, or yeah, uh, you really need to be ready to do that and okay to do that. So um, the, 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 the marching orders from me to my, my extras casting director was that I want, I want um, full disclosure on what the scenes would be and what it would entail so that they're making informed consent when they, when they say, yes, I'll come. So mm -hmm. in that way, uh, everyone who came knew what they were coming to do and did so, um, you know, with a, with a big heart. They, they, they knew what the film was about and they wanted to be a part of that process. So we, we never had problems booking who we needed. And uh, the beginning of those very difficult days, I met with all of the extras and I explained what would be happening that day. I, I let them know that it, if they could go to their darkest place for the scene, then together we can all do something really special. Um, but as soon as I yelled cut, I said I needed them to, to bounce back and like let it go mm -hmm. and to stay in, in, in positivity as much as possible that day, not only for their own well-being for all of us and specifically for the kids as well. Um, I told them that I, I, I want us to have a good time and have fun and this is the way we do it, is that we, as soon as we yell action, we, we perform and as soon as we yell cut, we come back to who we really are. And, and they did that, uh, you know, day after day, scene after scene, incredibly big hearted people, you would not believe it because you see them on screen and you just want to like strangle them, but mm. they they were wonderful people. And so the majority of the day is not, is not the angry racist, all of that stuff. It's all small and it takes a long time to set up the shot every single time. So most of the time we're smiling, we're laughing, you know, we're doing the wave, they're, they're, they're waving to the kids, they're cheering the kids on. Um, so so there, it was a very, what you see on screen is, and, and what our day looked like, <clears throat> uh, it, it, there's a big dramatic difference. And the kids, for instance, the way we came up with the shooting plan for the scene where they threw the rocks, um, the kids never actually experienced that. So the shots are very low in the car and we're down there with the kids. And so the crowd is not yelling. The crowd, the crowd is not screaming at the car. They're not, so they didn't have to throw the, the rocks, which were not real rocks. They were styrofoam um, fake rocks that hint, that sort of hit the car. They were like, potatoes. They were potatoes. <laughs> they hit the car with this like thud. Um, so, that even didn't have to happen, but it was the kids themselves who said, Tracy, is it okay if they still throw the fake rocks just so that I know where to look? Like I have something to react to. And I said, okay, if, if you want them to do that for your process, sure, they could do that. But at no point in that scene, you know, was anyone yelling or screaming or, or saying racist words? So um, what the kids experienced as much as possible was very much removed from 
those those scenes. And I think that that also that helped the extras be able to go to that dark place um, in a in a in a in a safe way that they they never had to say that to children. Um, you know, that's that's it's too terrible, even for even for make believe creation and we didn't have to do that so um there was many ways like that that we 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 came up with a method for the process to get what we needed but did so in a way that um, the energy stayed positive and connected and everyone's just so so big-hearted everyone came knowing what we were doing um, and it was it was really beautiful so were the extras um, did they have lines that they needed to say or was it improv? Just were they offered, you know, what the moment was and then you bring forward your energy? And with that, I noticed, you know, there's French, there's English. Um, and so I was curious about that interplay too. Yes. So we gave them a, a selection of, po of possible lines. Um, and in the moment, they were they were able to choose out of that selection, or, I mean, they were also free to, in, you know, invent other racist things that might have been said. So, um, and really it's, it's just like a, it's like a raw that comes at you. Right. So um, nobody was assigned specific lines. They were all able to choose what they were comfortable in character to say. Um, but we did, we didn't leave it up to them to just say like, hey, figure out some racist things. We did give them like, this is the, this is the, some of the stuff that was said, please choose accordingly or come up with what you might've heard on the news at the time or what you know that that racist person that lives near you says, um, you're, you're free to do that as well. Which probably helped them to separate the character from that exactly. kind of emotional attachment. Exactly. Yeah. I'm uh, also just noticing in our chat um, in relationship to this question and conversation, did you get assistance from the RCMP um, or, and my French is horrible, um, Surette du Québec? Surette du Québec. Du Québec in the making of this film. No, no, um, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't ask for it. We didn't, I didn't need it uh, because the film is very much told through the point of view of this little girl. You know, if you, if you see the film, I, so let me rephrase. The film isn't about the Oka crisis. The film is about a little girl who lives through the Oka crisis. And so the, the who and what and where of, of the conflict uh, was not my chief concern. And so, um, and, and, and there was no other reason that I would need the RCMP or the Sûreté de Québec to, uh, par to participate in helping me um, make this film. Although, okay, wait, that being said, let me add this in. Uh, a number of our police extras were police officers um, we're actual police officers that sometimes do extra work. So in that, so some of our extras were police officers, but, you know, we didn't approach the Sûreté de Québec or the RCMP. Our casting director has his group of people that he works with and a number of them were police officers and, uh, and came. Thank you for that. Yeah, I imagine there's just kind of a certain energy intention um, in creating that feel, but then also just you and your voice as a Mohawk director, as a human who went through the experience, also choosing perspective and whose voice is Absolutely. not only heard, but seen. Yeah. Um, and the last question related to that is where did you get the armored cars? So I can't tell you specifically where uh, that would have been handled by our art department. We had one tank, I believe, one tank. And there's, you know, Montreal is definitely a big production hub. So all of our period cars, the tank, um, I know we had a few other specials, uh, all came from rental houses around here. 
Yeah, it's interesting the impact that moment had in thinking just about the power implications at play in the crisis. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, okay, so I had one tank in my movie, but um, in the archival moments, I made sure to have the footage where you see dozens of tanks rolling mm -hmm. in, dozens and dozens of tanks rolling in to point at our communities, at the people I love. Um, I mean, when you're, when you're a kid and it's happening, you're kind of like rolling with it. But now as an adult, and looking back and knowing what happened that summer, that's just, that's incredible and awful. And I, I can't, I can't believe that the country would send its own army um, mm -hmm. against its own citizens. It's, I mean, I, I know we don't consider ourselves citizens of Canada, like we're, we're citizens of the Mohawk nation, but according to Canada, we are their citizens. So yeah, it, it was crazy. It was a crazy summer. And again, um, so this premiered at TIFF in September, is that yes. right? So I, I, uh, I'm thinking of the timeliness, especially in the States here with, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and defund police movement, where the, yeah, where tanks were coming into the yeah. cities and people yeah. were assaulted. The, this in terms of kind of Turtle Island or North America is a history that's unfolded towards, you know, indigenous black brown communities for a yep. long time. Yep. And we don't, we don't, I'll just add in there. I mean, we don't ever see it happen on white, white citizens. Like we just, just don't see that happen. So yeah, the film takes, the film is a, is a period piece, obviously. It took place in 1990. It's 30 years ago. And there's so many scenes in the film that were really mirrored in what we've seen gone on in this last year. And I just can't believe we haven't come further in 30 years. It's, mm -hmm. it's really frustrating. Truly. Yeah, it's a good reminder about, there goes my circus, my husband's certain dinner just <laughs> in the woods. I love it. That fire's going. Um, yeah, it, uh, it is a reminder that those people who have been on the front line, and there are those people for 30, 40 years who... Um, are reminding us that, you know, we're still planting seeds. We're still, you know, yeah. watching fruit come to bear from those seeds that were planted 30 years ago that yep. you can't let up. And that's a longitudinal, um, yep. you know, action in terms of making change, but it's still frustrating. And yep. it's still hard to see, especially when actions are taken in the military sense in that way, those resources. There is a comment here. Um, as a 74 year old white man, I was surprised at the emotional impact the film had on me, which caused me to wonder whether as the director you made choices to effectuate that type of impact on your audience. So who is your film for? Who is it for? So all of my work in my last 20 years has been for two audiences. There's indigenous viewers uh, and then there's non-Indigenous viewers. And there's, in all of my work, and specifically this film, there are, there are moments and there's storylines in there that are for our people um, to celebrate our strength, our resilience, to put forward this strong, young role model, who finds her voice, um, but definitely there, the film is also out there for a non-Indigenous audience. Um, all of my work, I wanna build bridges. I want, I so as a 12 year old, after the Oka crisis, I felt invisible, I felt worthless. Um, I felt misunderstood. And so I know now that my work seeks to heal those things in me. I want to be understood. I 
I, I don't want any other kids to feel that sense of worthlessness. And so I, I, I'm thrilled. Let me say, I'm thrilled to hear that um, the film got into your heart and has affected you. And that is definitely uh, what I'm hoping for in terms of a non-Indigenous audience, because we absolutely need our non-Indigenous allies. Um, what makes our lives so hard is actually not within our control. It's the larger society. And that is within our, our non-Indigenous allies world view life and we need we need for, and it's 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 the one of the one of the themes in the film right is we need we need more friends um so i hope that viewer is a now a very motivated friend of ours um, I, I noticed you wove this into the film and the teachings of, uh, of Lily, the mom, towards her daughter in terms of, you know, we need to behave in a way um, that is, you know, in keeping with our traditions or, you know, in keeping with role modeling, essentially, um, or when Beans decided to go back to school and she's like, I'm, I'm being in service, essentially, to the movement. I'm going there. So people know who I am, so we can create a bridge. Yeah. Yeah, and let me let me let me tell you a little story about that final mm -hmm. scene. Um, we didn't shoot it when we're shooting a film; it's all out of order. Um, so that final that final shot of her in the school, uh, it was maybe midway through production, um, but I knew that. I mean, this is my ending, and when I saw Giao and Dio dressed in her uniform. And I, I went to a private girls school. Um, her hair, the way her hair was fixed was the way I fixed my hair. And the barrette is my barrette that she wears, you know? When I saw her in that uniform and, and she, she stood there and, and owned her name and took her space, uh, I was bawling. I was bawling the entire, that entire, uh, scene that we shot, just crying and crying and crying. And part of it was for the little girl and me and thinking back to how scared and unsure she was. And part of those tears were also just so much pride for Gao and Dio and all of our young people like her who, who, who are so powerful and already, they're already owning their voice. And it took me a long time to find my voice and own my voice and to see her just take space, both as the character, but also as the actress, as this incredible young woman. Ugh. So for all those reasons, I was crying and crying and crying. <laughs> and I knew like when we, when we, when we finished it, I also knew like, okay, I have my ending. I don't know what's going to happen with all these other scenes and still have to shoot them, but we have the ending I want. And um, I'm just so pleased. I'm so pleased with that ending. A voice inside me. I was like, get it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, thank you for that. I'm looking at our questions again. Um, Karen is asking, it seemed that you used actual footage from the crisis, which you've said that you did um, quite effectively in the film. Um, what was the process for obtaining that footage and making choices about what to use? Okay, great question. I love this question. So. I'm a documentary filmmaker, uh, th that's, that's where I began. And many of my documentaries also dealt with the Oka crisis because it has played such a big role, I think, in my life as a person, as an artist. So I have been looking at archival footage from the Oka crisis throughout my career. Um, so I know what's out there and where it comes from is all of the news agencies that were 
active at the time. Some have gone out of business in the last 30 years, but those that still exist and were covering it then, um, they have all this footage tucked away in their archive. The process as a filmmaker is to um, get in touch with these organizations, these news organizations. You give them a period of time and, uh, and topics, a very specific topic, in this case, the Oka crisis that you're interested in, uh, seeing their archival footage. And you pay a small fee for the person who is gonna be digging around in their archive. And then they send you, and this, in this case, it's now digital, but back in the beginning of my career, it was on tape. Uh, <laughs> They send, it, they send it all to you and uh, you can play with it as you wish. Mm -hmm. And then once you figured out what you wanna use, you go back to those places and then it's time to negotiate and buy that archival footage. And ar archival footage is, is typically sold by the second. So you're gonna pay by the second. Um, in terms of building those moments, uh, there's four archival moments in the film. It was really important to me to use archival footage in the film. I wanted to make sure when people watch this film, I mean, again, there's some very disturbing moments uh, that make us very, that will make people uncomfortable. And I think it's a very natural reaction. It's a safety mechanism to, um, I, I, and you hear it all the time. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't that bad. Oh, I'm, I'm sure they've made that up. Mm -hmm. Oh, that couldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want I didn't want audiences to have that out. I wanted them, I wanted it to be clear that this really did happen. Um, and so for me, that's what the archival moments bring. They also gave me a scope of this event that I couldn't, I couldn't film the entire, I couldn't recreate the entire thing. You know, I'm, I'm working with specific budget constraints. Uh, it's also a perspective film. It's told through the point of view of a 12 year old. And I, as a 12 year old, I half the time, I didn't know what was going on. And I certainly wasn't all, I wasn't everywhere things were going on. Um, I knew the audience needed certain context to understand what Beans was going through. So it also gave me that. And in building each one, they, all, they each had, thematically, they were each delivering something different. Um, I had a wonderful time building those to support the fiction narrative. Yeah, for me, again, in the shopping scene, and then uh, you cut to the footage, yeah. it was just like such an exclamation mark. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for walking through that. I'm looking back at, there's quite a few questions here. Um, can, I, can I add one more oh, thing, yeah. Tracy? Um, yeah, sorry. So and if anyone's interested, so the, the rock throwing incident in the movie, that was one where I didn't, I didn't match it with archival footage because I really wanted us to stay with the character. But that footage has also is also out there and has been has been well presented. Um, and so, if anyone having watched this film wants to go and see what what actually happened thirty years ago in that moment. Um, you're able to find that. It's called it's called Rocks at Whiskey Trench. Great. And if our um, SIF allies can uh, put that in the chat, that would be fantastic. Thank you for that, Tracy. Um, so Patrick um, says, I grew up near Kanawage. It was 18 at the time. It was an awakening moment for me too. Between that and the protest against English speakers, it made me realize that racism is just everywhere. So it sounds yeah. like there's parallel social crisis happening at mm -hmm. the same time. For those of us, I have to say in the States, I don't think we have access to world news nearly as much as other countries or are taught to be critical thinkers or, lear or learn you know, other dynamics in different countries. Um, do you mind just sharing a little bit more about what was happening in 1990 um, when he says the protest against English speakers? Sure, so um, that would have been like the Anglophone, Francophone divide here in Quebec. Um, again, I, I, I mean, I was young at the time and I re really grew up in an, in an Anglophone bubble. Ganawage is an Anglophone bubble within a French province. 
Uh, but that tension still does exist today. Um, but it was really at its height back in the, the 80s and 90s. Well, even the 70s, even the 70s, 70s 80s, 90s. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was a similar, it was a similar divide of who belongs here, who doesn't. Um, and it was all based on, it was based around language. Well, language and, and culture and uh, the Quebecois people, the Francophone Quebecois cultural people, uh, you know, their, their worry and their fear was, was the erase, the erase rate. <laughs> erasure of their culture mm -hmm. um but in 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 fighting to protect it i mean that's I, I i think we all we all can value and protect what what is ours but when we do so to the detriment of others mm -hmm. that's that's where we step over and i and i think that's that's what was going on at the time mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I appreciate helping us learn just a little bit more. I think it adds to our understanding a bit. Um, so we have just a few more moments left. I'm really interested in where this film is going next um, and how people in the US can have more access to seeing it. Because again, it's just so timely, but also just um, what's next for you as a maker? Mm. Okay, so first and foremost, the film has been picked up for American distribution by Film Rise. So, so happy Yay. about that. Yay. <laughs> um, and plans are, are still being figured out. So I, I don't have more news beyond that, but it will be this year um, in some shape or form in the United States. So please keep watch. And please, if you did enjoy the film and you think others should see it, please spread the word. Um, in terms of myself, I am figuring that out right now. Um, it's been a wonderful six months since we premiered. It's, it's been in so many festivals and I've been on panels and doing workshops. So I've been very busy with that and it's been wonderful. And I have another feature that I've, I've recently finished writing. We'll see, we'll see where that goes. Um, there's a television show I'm developing and uh, as a director, I'm, I'm a director who just loves to direct. So I'm also doing episodic television work uh, when I can. And did I see that your film is up for some awards? Yes, so the, <laughs> Canadian, the Canadian Screen Awards is our version of Emmys. Emmys. Okay. They're, they're our version of the Emmys. Yes. Um, well, it's actually, it's, it's sort of our version of the Emmys and the Oscars because it, it's television and it's film. And Beans uh, is up for Best Picture. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. As well as a number of other categories. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a nomination for Best Casting. Art My DOP has, has a nomination for Best Cinematography. Um... There's two other ones. Why kind of, oh yeah, this best sound mixing and oh man. Best first feature, Dustin. Oh, oh that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's the one for me. <laughs> yeah, best first feature, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dustin. I love that. <laughs> yeah, first feature film. Yeah. Wow. Right out of the gate. Just incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I guess as we're moving towards wrapping and thinking about um, what's, you know, next steps for you. I also, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, there's, there's been conversation, of course, around Indigenous cinema, but it feels as though different nations and communities are even moving more towards for example, Haudenosaunee cinema or Mohawk cinema, um, and just seeing people within different nations, the the numbers of makers are just increasing. It's floating. Really yes, it's so great. Yeah. If you could, um, if you don't mind, um, share any thoughts you have for your community and the 
people there who are inspiring you or that we should keep on our radar who are Mohawk makers? Mm. Uh, well, Zoe Lee Hopkins, uh, I, and you, you must know Zoe. Do you know Zoe? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, from my community, specifically from my community? Um, or broadly speaking, um, yeah. I'm, I'm just recognizing that we're, uh, Indigenous cinema is awesome, but it seems like communities in general, small and expanded, are, um, yeah, it's just <laughs> developing their own language and aesthetic and absolutely dimensions. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, up here in Canada, it's it's a very tight knit Indigenous filmmaking community, and mm -hmm. so um, you know, a lot of my colleagues and peers, they're they're not they're not just Mohawk. Um, and so, yeah, the names that are coming to me are, are outside of my community at the moment, but, but there's definitely lots of talent uh, being developed, like in all of our communities. It's, it's yeah. really exciting. Yeah, it's such a moment. It just feels as though there's a lot of energy and a lot of motion forward. I'm just yes. really excited. <laughs> and I think we're we're finally in a moment now where the where the mainstream is is open, mm -hmm. interested, motivated. Uh, I'm getting so many projects pitched to me. I'm I'm having meetings. So I think there's I think there's a lot more coming, which mm -hmm. is going to be fantastic. I think people are hungry for fresh takes yes. and stories. Yeah. And we've, and we've got them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Tracy, any last thoughts before we wrap? Uh, I really appreciate everyone who tuned in to watch the film. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this platform. I love talking about my work. Uh, the film took... Well, one, I, I wanted to be a filmmaker ever since I was 12 years old and I lived through this when I was 12 years old. So I had the idea that one day I wanted to tell this story when I, you know, when I made it. Um, so this really, this film is 30 years in the making for me. Um, but in terms of creative process, it's been about 10 years, you know, writing the script took forever. So to be here in this moment is just incredibly fulfilling for me and, knowing people are seeing the film and are feeling from the film and are talking about the film. I mean, that is, that is the most fulfilling. So thank you to everyone. Thank you for screening it. Thank you for the people who watched it and thank you for um, giving me the space to come on and talk about it. Thank you. Um, and again, thank you to the audience for showing up today. Uh, check out Tracy's Film Beans at sif.net. You can get your ticket online. And if you happen to live in the Seattle region, uh, next weekend we're showing it Saturday night in Oak Harbor at the drive-in. It's a pretty uh, cool experience seeing it on the big screen at the drive-in. It feels very much in community. Um, so I encourage you to check it out online or go to a drive-in and to um, keep up with Tracy Deer and her amazing career that continues to unfold. Take care. Thank you, Anna. Take care.